tonight is a JMCW, Jewish Mindfulness Center of Washington, Macomb, D.C. mashup event. <laughs> We're excited uh, to be here with James, Rabbi James Jacobson Mazels. We'll introduce in a minute. But because it's a mashup event and it's a JMCW event, we just want to take a moment and lift up the Jewish Mindfulness Center because yesterday it was named for the second year in a row to one of Slingshot's most innovative and transformative programs in the country. <laughs> that clapping, for the most part, should be directed at Rabbi Lauren Holtzblatt. <laughs> but I, I know, at humility and hubris. <laughs> Show some. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of great leadership in the room for the JMCW, so just raise your hand if you're, if you're one of the people who make that thing, to, and just raise it. Raise it just so we can thank you. Thank you. Wow. You had to talk about hubris tonight. <laughs> um, uh, really, it's, um, it is well known in the Jewish world that um, with all of the hundreds of startups that are, that are popping up around the country and doing amazing work, that Slingshot's list identifies the ones that are most transformative, most innovative, most sustainable, and have the most energy. And so it's not a small thing for Addis Israel to have this program housed inside of its walls and outside of its walls. And it's something that we are all quite proud of. Thank you. Yeshua Koach, Mazel Tov. Um, and now I'm gonna hand over the microphone to Lauren so she can introduce That's That's awkward. <laughs> Welcome. We're so, yeah, it was. Um, we're so happy you're here. Um, and uh, it's great to have all of you in the room. It's so great. It's full tonight. Um, okay. Um, this is Rabbi James Jacobson Mizels. Mazels depends on what tradition you come from, <laughs> how you say it. Um, Ashkenaz, far, I don't know. Knew him before, didn't know him. Anyway. Um, he's an incredible teacher, as we'll get to right away. Um, this is James' second year with us. He came last year as part of a weekend with the JMCW and is just an incredible teacher. Um, he runs a program called um, Or Halev in Israel and leads meditation retreats all over the country. Is a teacher at the Pardes Institute as well as Machon Adar in New York. And we're so thrilled to have you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here. everybody. Wonderful to be here. Uh, I need to be here through the microphone, apparently, although I'm sure you can all hear me without the microphone. I can walk with it. I don't know if that's going to work. It'll just get near me. Um, so, so when I you know, was invited here to come to Addis, which is very exciting to be here, and to study together, I was told the theme of this month is this amazing theme of hubris and humility which is an amazing theme, you know, in general. It's certainly an amazing theme in the middle of an election cycle. Um, and, and what that means um, to show up with hubris and humility. <coughs> and and um, we've done, you know, for people who are here on Shabbat, we did a whole series of studying and explorations. Uh, but when Aaron and Lauren told me the theme, the very first thing that came to mind was the text we're going to begin with. Um, and we're going to start with this text, and then we're going we're to really sort of go through and, and start to unpack and sort of question that text and see what happens when we turn it on its head and how it works. So let's just start with that very first text. It's a famous um, teaching from Rabbi Simcha Budim, uh, early Polish Hasidic master. And Rabbi Simcha Budim would say to his students, every one of you must have two pockets, not for your wallet and your cell phone, right? but in order that you may use one or the other as needed. What does that mean? In the right pocket should be placed the text, for my sake the world was created, right? Hubris. In the left one should be placed the text, I am but dust and ashes, okay. Right, so you gotta walk through the world with these two pockets, and you gotta have them. It's like, you know, you're quick on the trigger. <laughs> when you need one, you know which pocket is in, you pull it out. So when do you need those 
those notes, right? What are those notes about? When do you need, you know, the right pocket? Let's say that uh, for my sake, the world is created in the right pocket. I am but dust as ashes in the left. What, 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 is, what, what is the instruction Rabbi Simcha Bunim is trying to give you? What is he trying to tell you? How are you supposed to use these notes? Good, it seems like, right, it seems like the teaching is basically about how do I balance? How do I stay connected to both of these important aspects of what it means to be a human being, to know my, my grandeur, my wonder, my profound importance, and to know my nothingness, my humility, that I'm just a speck in the midst of the universe. And it seems like, well, if I kind of forget how important I am, then I should reach into the, for my sake, the world is created. And on the other hand, if I kind of, you know, get too grandiose, too big on myself, then I should reach into the I am but dust and ashes, right? Makes sense, the one is hubris, when we sort of lost that sense of our own self-worth maybe in that way, and the other is humility, right? So we've got too grandiose, too full of ourselves, we gotta reach for the humility, and that way we start to be able to balance each other out. And I think uh, that's a totally sensible read of these notes, and it is one read of these notes, and it makes sense, right? And I think if we start to look at where these two quotes are coming from, we're gonna see something quite surprising about what is actually the underlying, the subtext of both of these quotations. What are they actually calling upon, upon us to be? And by doing that, we're gonna start to ask a question about what is the real nature of hubris? And what is the real nature of humility? And where do they actually each pull us toward? Okay, so that's gonna be sort of our opening question. So here's now what I would like you to do. So if you look at the next two sections of your, um, source sheets, you can see there's a section titled, I am but dust and ashes, and a section titled, for my sake, the world is created. And in those sections, you will find the source text for both of these phrases, right? Where are these phrases coming from? What I'd like you to do is turn to somebody next to you, and I'd like you to read through each of those texts. You'll see I have helped you out by underlining, just in case you missed it, where our phrase occurs in those texts. And you'll see underneath of those texts, there are a series of questions I want you to answer about those texts. And just before we do that, I'm gonna give you a, a, a moment of context for each of those texts. Many of you may know these contexts already, uh, the context emerges in the text, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. So the first text <coughs> is about uh, Abraham, uh, Abraham's encounter with the angels and encounter with God, and in particular, God's um, threat to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham's objection, and how does that end? What happens in the end? Not so well. It doesn't end so well for Sodom and Gomorrah, right? <laughs> so like, we're not gonna get into the final ending, but just so we all know, in the end, Sodom and Gomorrah get it, right? Uh, Abraham doesn't win that argument, and we'll, we, we'll explore why. The second text is from the Mishnah in Sanhedrin. Um, Sanhedrin is a tractate of the Mishnah, the Talmud, which deals to a great extent with um, the process of the legal system in many ways, and that's the context of our teaching here. And in particular, it's talking about how the court needs to prepare witnesses in a capital case, right? So you're trying somebody for a capital crime, like murder, somebody for whom could be received the death penalty. You have witnesses who saw this person kill the other guy, right? Or whatever they saw in that circumstance. And there's a procedure that we're told has to be gone through between the judges and the witnesses to make sure those witnesses are clear about how incredibly serious this role of theirs is, right, of testifying before this person and what it means to take on that role as a witness in this incredibly important case, okay? So those are context. So take a few minutes right now, turn to the person next to you, start to read through those texts. Um, the first text is a narrative, don't stop with every sentence, get through the narrative, get a sense of it, do the same with the second text, and come back and answer the questions together.
if as you're learning, questions arise and you want a helping hand, you can raise your hand and I'm happy to come around and help.
if you haven't made it to the second text yet, I'm just encouraging you to head in the direction of the second text. This is a two minute warning.
So start to come to an end of wherever you are. We're going to gather and get together again. I know you haven't had time to finish or fully explore those texts. But hopefully you've gotten somewhere and at least read them both, and we're going to come together and start to discuss them. OK, so bringing us back together. And there's more to say. We're going to say it together now, not just between with our Chabruta partners. So I want to start with the context in Genesis, Abraham's context, right? And you've all read now the context in which Abraham says, right, I am but dust and ashes. So why does he say this, right? Why does Abraham say that at that moment? What is the, what's the context? What's the force? What's the significance of that statement? Why is he saying that? Okay, yeah, he is. Tell me more about that. Why is he saying that? Because he's arguing with God. Okay, okay. But I, I, okay, I hear that. So, right. So, there's this. Good. But there's, there's certainly, just sort of the first thing you said, right, which is fascinating. So, this is the text of humility, right? But it's in a context of extraordinary hubris, right? I mean, extraordinary hubris, right? It's actually like, think about, you know, the scariest person you've had to confront, whoever that person was, the scariest confrontation you've had to do. And now it's like, oh. <laughs> Take that up 10 notches, right? And then multiply it another 1,000 times. It's like, OK, I'm confronting you, right? <laughs> like you, destroyer, creator, the whole thing, right? This is the relationship here in this moment. It's like, oh, you tell me you're going to do this thing? I'm actually calling you out on that, right? And calling you out quite seriously, right? He says, I love it, you know, in verse 25, he says, right, Khalila. Far be it from you, it says in the English, right? So in modern Hebrew, we say chas v'chalila, which basically means God forbid. It's like, God forbid you should do this, God, right? <laughs> right, I mean, and, it, and it's a great line because he basically says to him, he says to God, you know, which is like we'd love to say to anybody when they're messing up or our kids or whatever, it's like, this isn't you, right? It's like, this, this, this isn't you, right? This is who you are, that's right. So there's like this incredible amount of hubris in the midst of this statement. So what else? So why is he saying this in the midst of that hubris? Well, Good. I want to keep exploring. So what exactly like is that undercutting and what is the bullshit? That's absolutely right. Like there's something there about saying in some sense, it's like, you know, one way to read this is Avram saying, Okay, God, this is not about me. Right? This is not about me, but here's what I have to say. And I gotta say it anyway.
that's great, right? And that sense of humility here, the humility is actually like knowing myself. Oh, yeah, I, I, know, I know I am a tiny speck in the midst of the universe. That's who I am. I don't have to pretend I'm something else, right? And this is how it is, right? And calling out that truth from the place of sort of, it's not about me, it's not about the ego here. It's just about this is who I am, and I can call it, and I can, I can claim myself, I can own myself, and I can still speak the truth that I need to speak at that moment. So, <coughs> sort of to ask two questions here. Yeah, go ahead. I'll just say this, but I don't want to get sort of involved too much in the semantics sort of question, um, you know, and, and like sort of the, the, the means of hubris, but let's just talk about it as daring then, right? Like, is there just daring happening there, right? It's like, and that place of which I think there's this question about is I think often we talk about, when we talk about those two words, it's like humility is a place of kind of making myself smaller in some way. You know, so it's in a very gross way if we sort of metaphorize those two words and probably how they popped out, at least to me, you know. It's like humility is making myself smaller, it's making space for the other, and hubris or daring or whatever that is, is kind of making myself bigger. It's like claiming my space. There's m ego there, there's loss of ego here, something like that. And uh, what's interesting here is precisely that the way in which these two elements are being brought together. So Ab Abraham is naming this sense of very much sort of knowing who I am in a non-hubristic um, maybe way, right? In a way that's not sort of overstating who I am, and at the same time, tremendous daring and the willingness to confront the greatest power. Is it sense of service and, of, I mean, not of course, but I think there's a echo here, of course, of the creation tale, right? Because the human being is made from the dust of the ground, right? Armin Adama. So that same terminology is there of like, this is where I come from. In a certain sense, I come from you. We are, I mean, there's a way of, of reading dust and ashes here, right? I don't know if it's the, the surface level shot, but maybe we're saying, which is saying, we are connected, remember? You know me of day of dust and ashes because that's what you made me from, right? <laughs> like, just in case we've forgotten this connection here. And I think exactly just as you're saying, and it's like, that was what you made Adam from. So all those other people you're talking about destroying, that's what they're like too, right? This is, there's actually a profound connection between us all here. And Abraham is naming that connection from that place of humility. I think it's very interesting the way you say, you say that, and there's almost a, I haven't thought about this before, but there's almost a reverse echo of that um, in Jonah, in the book of Jonah, right, where the end where it's God saying to Jonah, it's just a bunch of people there who, like, don't know their head from their foot, you know what I mean? And a bunch of animals besides, right? <laughs> and a bunch of cattle besides in this scene where Jonah sort of doesn't care if God's going to destroy the city or not of Nineveh, 
right? And God has to sort of remind Jonah in his opposite way. It's like, remember there are human beings there who are just a bunch of confused folks like you. Maybe we should try to do something about that. So it's really interesting. Interesting there also in that context, exactly where you're pointing to, which is, you know, Hashem says there, I, could, I can't hide this from Abraham, of course. And he's like, of course, when we've got this special relationship going and the person Abraham is going to be, it requires me. I'm kind of like morally obligated at this moment to involve Abraham in this experience and sort of be involved in that process. The what? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that that is that sense of like God's, it's, it's a rhetorical question, right? He's saying like, of course I shouldn't hide, right? I, and you could actually just even read the Hebrew. It says, it says like, because there's the, the hey of the inter interrogative. It's a hamichatse'ani me Abraham, asher ani yoseh. Would, could I, you could even read it as, could I or would I hide from Abraham what it is I'm about to do? Well, of course I couldn't hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, right? This whole sense of what Abraham's supposed to be in the world and this blessing, it, it can't work if I'm going to hide from Abraham. ultimate power and like of course I'm going to consult with my advisor here right how can I not consult yeah. yeah that's right right his whole claim to God is I know who you are this can't be who you are right so now I want to ask a follow-up question to this which is so what would this model look like as a model of political action if we went into the election cycle, we went into our work for justice, you know, our campaigning, whatever that looked like, from the stance of humility rather than arrogance. And what would be the daring that would come from that place of humility? And I really want to ask this sort of as concretely as possible for us to just to think together, um, what would that look like, right? What would that look like to try to approach that work from the place of humility, from a place of speaking truth in the way that Abraham said? I'm going to push you a little bit more, right? It's like, I'm going to push you a little bit more. Here's who I am. Okay, good. Yes.
great. So what does that look like? What does it look like? That's really interesting, right? It's like, there, or even there isn't even like the equation of should I risk this because maybe it'll have that impact. But it's like this is the truth. I'm going after the truth, which, I, th which in that, I mean, I'll, I'm going to say it this way. I, for me, my experience of that is like when I can sort of, to the extent that I can, drop that. I'm not attached to the result in the same way. I'm committed to the result. Result. Right? But if, I, if it's not personal, if it's not about me, if my ego isn't involved in it, then I'm not attached to the result in the same way. And that means for me, there's actually more spaciousness in my action. There's no possibility for love and there's more possibility for risk because when my ego is involved, for me, you know, I know the, how do I, the easiest way for me, me to burn out in, in action, sort of action, it's like I me ego gets involved and then I lose because I lose all the time, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, but right? <laughs> That's the reality of my physical life, right? So I lose all the time. And then if my ego's too involved, then I'm just projecting. And then it's easy to fall into the place of hopelessness. Yeah. So you realize that you the face, right? I'm just that's an act. not personal, but how do we engage in actually the issue at hand, which is not about me. It's not about me, it's not about you, right? It's not about me getting involved in my argument because it's my position, I have to defend my position. But can we actually engage in a genuine, right, machlokal Hashem Shemayim, can we enter a genuine disagreement? Exactly, what negotiation about the issue itself, right? Interesting, you know, and I, I hear the read. Well, one which we haven't addressed yet, one of the complications here, of course, is that Abraham loses, right? I mean, to a certain extent, like he wins the argument in a certain sense, in the sense of he bargains God all the way down to 10, but it doesn't work out well for Sodom and Gomorrah, right? So it's not like 10 doesn't serve. Now we can, there are all discussions about the Beth that said that minimum number, and do you need a minimum number to make change in society? And on the side, it's fascinating that 10 is our number for Minyan. And basically, all the examples of like minyan are like bad, right? So <laughs> it's here. the the classic The classic is the spies, right? Which also did not turn out well for us, right? <laughs> so it's a whole interesting question of like, why is ten the minimum community when it's actually a minimum of like people doing bad stuff together, you know, or not enough people to be able to resist evil? Uh, we can put that on the side. Um, but but it is interesting that question, right? So you're saying like. Do you stay dust and ashes, or is the pursuit of justice something that stops you from being dust and ashes? Right. 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 Good. Good. And I think that is a powerful part about the story, right? So it's like Abraham's going to go for it, and he's going to pursue it, and then even at the end, he's you know he's going to make sure that you know people are taken care of, or at least you know people can get out, get out, even if he loses, basically. Even if he loses, there's going to be a confrontation. And then there are lots of questions about, you know, how that works out and why Abraham doesn't confront about other things later on, right? All kinds of questions, but yes. So what else would that look like?
Okay, pause there for a second. I'm going to take one more comment here, and then we're going to move on to the next. to the next text, but I, I want us to just, you know, we, we, there are pieces of which we threw out to just keep sitting with that question. I know I do. It's like, what would it be to advocate from a place of humility, right? To advocate from a place of where it's not about me, where a place of humility is not a place of being a doormat. It's a place of incredible strength and clarity, but it's also a, a place of great humility, which is also partly humility sometimes about being like, I'm going to totally advocate for this. And I could be wrong, right? Because that's like part of what humility is. I recognize that I'm just a human being and I make mistakes sometimes like everybody else. I can advocate with this without lording it over you, without shaming you, right? But with just pointing out as far as I can in the depth of that commitment to the subject itself, what seems to me to be true in the end. So that's sort of one side. So our next side now is our other text, right? So again, so this text from the pocket story seems like Oh, you're feeling down on yourself. You should remember that for your sake the world was created, right? And it's absolutely part about that. But I want to sort of go through here and pick it apart a little bit and explore it together. So first, let's just start with that first paragraph and the setup. So they are, they are inspiring the witnesses with awe, or you could read it as threatening the witnesses. Um, why? Why are they, why does this process start up? Why are they relating to the witnesses in this way? What's the goal here? Truth, good. Well, what are they worried about? What are their two maybe concerns? Okay, so one concern is unjust punishment. They want to make sure you recognize how serious this is and you're going to be totally truthful about it. Good. What's the other concern? Okay, good. So there's truth about which is also about unjust. So one concern is the broader category of you might testify falsely in some way. But what's the other concern they have, which especially expresses itself at the bottom of the text? Okay, exactly right. So the witness has this incredible moral culpability. Right? But I just want us to see that it's in both ways, right? It's both, they're very, very concerned that you might kill somebody, and they're also very concerned that you might abdicate your responsibility of testimony. Right? So the other side is like once you recognize your great responsibility, you may be like, forget it. You know, why do I, why do I want any part of this? I'm out of here, right? Like I don't need to get involved in this whole problem. And they want to infuse in you both the tremendous responsibility of being completely honest and truthful and straight, and the responsibility you do have to come forth and give testimony because you are, you know, we can have this discussion about like protecting society, taking care of society in some way. Like what is it you're doing in that moment? So what is this statement about paying you that every person is obligated to say for my sake the world was created? Why, why is that being communicated to these witnesses, right? What's the power and the, and the significance of that statement here? Okay, why? Ah, so there is a, you know what it says, there's a profound uniqueness, right, to every human life, right? To your human life and to the human life of the accused, right? For every single person out there, the world was created for that person's existence, right? Everything exists, everything is its own and end in itself, as Kant would say, right? Everything is an end in itself and there's tremendous uh, importance. So not only are we each sort of essentially, um, you know, profoundly important, but we are no more important than anybody else, right? That performance is actually equally shared among all of the members of humanity.
And that's exactly right, because that's why, you know, when you kill a human being, you destroy the whole world. Right? And that whole reading of Demei, right, Demei, Achicha, the blood, as you write it, that exact, you're destroying an entire world. So this, I think, again, you know, from, if we compare our sort of initial read of that statement, the initial read of the statement was, oh, when you're, like, feeling down or not important or, like, you know, you're not special enough, you should bring out this, 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 this verse. And, and again, that makes sense. Because the verse is about recognizing your incredible <coughs> specialness, but it's actually about recognizing compassion, right? Like the verse is actually brought out here for you to recognize, oh, first of all, this person that we're going to judge right now is an entire world, and I better be as careful and as honest and as clear as I can possibly be, right? So the recognition of that is not actually about me or me being totally better than other people, but about this incredible care for each and every member of humanity. And it's a way of making you take responsibility for your own life and your own honesty, right? Because how can I corrupt myself when I am equal to the whole world, right? When the world was created for my sake, right? So there's a profound claim both on the individual and on the relationships, which are actually claims of responsibility. Right, if we might think of sort of hubris or pride or something as sort of claims for ourselves, well, I have to sort of think about myself in a certain way. When we look at the context of the verse, it's actually saying, no, 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 if you remind yourself of your own goodness or your own self-worth in order to be profoundly aware of both, A, what is expected of you, right, and B, the profound worth and importance of every other human life. Right? There's a connection between that and your own experience. So again, I want to like ask this now outside of the text, which is, well, how does that work and does that work? Like, is that true or not? You know, when we can see our own profound importance, what effect does that actually have on us? What does effect does it have on you? Are there moments in your life where you sort of loved yourself, right? Or recognized that you were beloved or saw your worth or significance? And what did that do to you? How did you, how were you enjoined to act out of that sense of one's own profound importance? How were you not enjoying to act out of that? Like what, what was the concrete effect or what could you imagine that concrete effect could be in your experience? So there has to be some kind of grounding of self-love right, and appreciation to have that genuine love and appreciation for others. Good, right? That's exactly what the text is talking about. So the, in language, uh, we talked about this on Shabbat a bit, but some of the Hasidic language says, you know, you have to think about yourself as a ben melech, as a prince. Right? Because when you know you're a prince, you're like, well, that's not appropriate for a prince to do, right? <laughs> like, you know, like, come on, a prince wouldn't be acting that way, right? And there's this sense of, like, noblesse oblige, right? It's like, oh, I, I'm a prince. I have responsibility here, actually. I've got to take care of this kingdom. When I see myself some way, I'm called to act in a certain way. You have to take responsibility for your life, right? Because nobody's going to take responsibility for it. It's like, you know, one of my favorite quotes, Rav says in the Gemara, that when you die, you have to retain din v'cheshbon, you have to give an accounting for the heavenly court of every permissible pleasure that you did not take, uh, did you not experience, right? <laughs> <laughs> that you did not take, that you did not avail yourself of when that uh, permissible pleasure came around, right? And that's part of, you, you actually have a responsibility to live your life. It's not just about like, you know, keeping them in the box, whatever. It's like if you haven't lived it, you've squandered this sort of precious, amazing opportunity of being born into a human life.
I, I love that. It's sort of like the, the mirror of the mea right? It's like when we damage, it has that incredible domino effect. But it's also, of course, mitzvah goreg mitzvah, every act of positivity has a tremendous effect, that, that wave effect out. Yeah. talk in, in, uh, in Chazal, in the sages, they talk about Yirat Shamayim, fear of heaven. But fear of heaven is actually, it's, it's talk about many things, but one major, major meaning of that category basically is being moral, being ethical. A person who has Yirat Shamayim is somebody who's ethical. Because basically they do things even when only heaven's watching, right? <laughs> it's like, right? And, and there are all these wonderful texts, you know, which are, I think, uh, you know, I identify with, I don't know if you identify with, but it's like, well, if you're really sort of thinking about heaven or something a bit broader, it's like, how come you would act totally differently and nobody's watching you? And actually, you have much more yurat adam, right? There's much more fear of like people seeing you in a certain way than that broader concept. And these texts, that's exactly right, call us to a certain kind of response. So, so I just want to pause there for a moment. And, and just to notice, I think these texts, you know, that amid, original statement, the teaching is in many ways about balance. I don't want to throw that away. It is about, you know, saying, we get lost on one side, sometimes we need to correct it. If we get lost on the other side, then we need to correct it. But one thing that I want us to see, and especially I think, which is our whole like tradition, which is so engaged in the textual sources and referencing itself all the time, is that when we look at the context of these teachings, what we actually see is what humility actually means is not like I've gotten too full of myself and now I have to like knock myself down a notch, right? Humility means I've gotten too full of myself and I need to let go of that kind of ego attachment so that I can serve what is actually true in this moment, right? So that I can take profound responsibility for the world in this moment, right? And what's interesting, right, which is why they're actually the same thing in these things, right? Is that on the other hand, the other note is saying the same thing. When I've lost my sense of my own self-worth, my own meaning, my own responsibility, my own belovedness, right? It's not that I just sort of have to like, you know, recognize. It's not like uh, what is this, Stuart Smiley? Is that what he's called, Smalley? Am I alive? Right. For those who remember that, right? I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. <laughs> and gosh darn it, people like me, right? It's it's that sense. What what? He's a senator. He's a senator. <laughs> um, we have to remember who we are, right? And then if we remember what is our nature, right? what is our genuine nature, which is basically a child of God, right? a uh, profoundly important, unique piece of creation, then how can we not take responsibility for ourselves and for the world? Right? And so both of these notes actually call us back to the same center. Right? And the center is that awareness of it's not about me, and it is about recognizing who I fundamentally am, which is dust and ashes, and which is the reason for the creation of the world. And that gives me a profound responsibility going forward. So now I want to look at, we'll see what we have time for, um, two other things in this context which I think, um, well, are interesting, moving, and, and connected to the sense of how do we work with um, pride and with humility, and, and what it means to, to transform, to try to transform ourselves in the world from the perspective of, of these two places in ourselves. So I want to, the, not the next section, but the section after that is called Pride and Spiritual Resistance. So this is a text from Rabbi Kolonimus Talmud Shapira, the Projector Rebbe, from his work, the Esh Kodesh, which as you may be able to note from the dating of his teaching, right, is teachings which happen in the Warsaw Ghetto during the war, right? So this is a book which is uh, uh, his own recording, his own writing down 
of what he taught as his drash on Shabbat in the Warsaw Ghetto during the war. Now this book, along with some other of his work, um, was buried in a, a milk carton underground uh, before the ghetto was liquidated and before uh, the Rebbe was taken to a work camp where he was shot to death by the SS. Um, along with a number of other archives of the ghetto, people may know the Onik Shabbos archives, for instance, which are famous archives which were kept by the Warsaw uh, Jewish community and hidden and now are Yad Vashem, which tells a tremendous amount of information about cultural, economic, religious, etc. life of the community. So he hid his own writings. Uh, thankfully, uh, they were found by a Polish construction worker after the war. Uh, so I don't know if people have seen pictures, but because of the uprising, the Germans basically like flattened the ghetto, you know, that part of Warsaw where the Jews are. So after that, the Poles, of course, had to reconstruct that part of Warsaw. So um, a Polish construction worker found this in the reconstruction efforts. There was a letter on top saying, um, you know, please hand this over to the Jewish community, which they did, and to send it to his brother. Now his brother, part of this amazing family, his brother was a Hasidic Zionist who had made Aliyah to Israel uh, before the war and helped set up a Hasidic Zionist community in Israel, which was a kind of Hasidic labor Zionist community. So they were farming, they were connected to the land. He was a um, friend and student of Rav Kook. Um, right, so a fascinating, extraordinary family in, in a million ways. Okay. So this is a teaching of the Rebbe, as you can see, uh, February 7, 1942. So we are well, well into the war. Right? We are well into the war here. This is not the beginning. This is well, and this is almost the end of the ghetto. In the spring of this year, uh, the ghetto will be liquidated, right? So we're, we're really near the end. Um, and here's what I'd like you to do. Um, I'd like you to take a look at this text together with the per person next to you. Again, read it out loud. I'm going to give you, again, not a ton of time, uh, but about maybe seven minutes, something like that, ten minutes. Um, I want you to read through it, do your best to understand it, and try to answer again the questions below. Right? What is, how is, is pride here and, you know, proper pride and proper humility a form of spiritual resistance in this extraordinary circumstance? Got it?
All right, let's, let's come back together. Hopefully we've already at least made it through the text. So I'd like to ask you a question, which is, let's just start with sort of the broad question, which is how, what, how, you know, I gave it this title, of course, so that's my view, but how are the teaching in this text a form of spiritual resistance? Right, so there was physical, of course, resistance in the ghetto, crucial. There was an uprising eventually. But there were other kinds of resistance which happened not just in the ghetto, but in the rest, you know, in all, all over the Jewish world in response to Nazi oppression. So how is this teaching a form of resistance to Nazi oppression? How does it resist that oppression? One piece of that, right, and I, I love that it's, as one person said to me, like, it, the text is just heartbreaking, right? You know, I mean, it's just, it's just heartbreaking. Um, and, and, but that, that, that image of being a captured prince, right, even though tor tortured, is nonetheless a tortured prince. It's like, whatever you do to me, whatever you do to my body, you cannot take from me that sense of my own nobility. Right, that sense of my own nobility is there, and it is core with me. Right, but but what's the danger? What's the possibility? Why is the resistance necessary? What does he describe as part of sort of like uh, as part of the result of what happens to this process of oppression? There's a danger, and we should know this is not the only place he talks about it. This is a very important theme of his in the, in the work of Eish Kodesh, which occurs in multiple places and in multiple different forms. But there's a very clear sense, he says that, to, to really name the fact that one of the things the oppression does is that we start to believe it. Right? The people who are oppressed start to buy the narrative. Even if in some ways you're resisting the narrative, you start to buy the narrative, it's like, oh, they think we're rats. So we must be rats in some way. Right? So we start to internalize that message, that sense. And, and it's, of course, not unique to us. I think it happens in situations of oppression, right, broadly, and, and both whether those are like broad political situations of oppression or we're talking about abuse which happens in families, right, and violence, like, right, that the, the person who is ex experiencing that, unfortunately, often starts to take on the message, right, and the narrative of the oppressor, right? And so one of the things he's encouraging the people present to do is to remember to not accept that story, right? That's not the true story. There's a different story, which is the true story. And another teaching I'll just mention, which is a also profoundly powerful teaching, he says, you know, the Nazis look at you and they see something that is subhuman, right? And he says, and it's not your problem, it's their problem. They are actually unable to see your magnificence and your majesty and you have to, your task is to constantly recall your own magnificence and majesty in the face of that seeing which detracts from you, which takes away from you. others in that same way.
can I sort of key you on to that and ask a second half of the question for a moment? So you talk about freedom, which I think is very important. And you know, Viktor Frankl, of course, also talks about this and sort of the, the, the capacity to, s to choose even in these most dire circumstances and the kind of, and that sense of, of humanity, right, and, and meaning which comes with that. So I think it's clear we've discussed that sense of how seeing my nobility is part of that resistance to oppression. But what I want us to also notice is that what he also talks about just as much is seeing my flaws and my obligation to work on myself is also a resistance to oppression. So I want to open up that now. Like, why is that? Right? It's not just seeing my nobility, but also, and he talks about that already, he wants, he wants to name that also in the same moment. Right? Seeing the fact that I am flawed and my obligation and capacity to work on those flaws, to, to continually to transform, why is that also a form of resistance to oppression? And how does he describe that here? He describes it here, but he says, when we fall into that place of feeling too comfortable or hollow, then um, there's nothing to work on, right? Then we're lost, we're in despair, like there's no, and there's something actually empowering, right? There's empowering about saying, even in the midst of this horror, you can still choose how to be in the world. You can still work on yourself, you can still be more or less compassionate, you can still be you know, whatever it is you're being, like there's, there's actually still choices you can make. And you know, it, it's sort of, it, it's very, you know, talking about like hubris and humility, I always feel very uncomfortable talking about this. It's like, what the heck do I know, right? Um, um, but his words have just been, he's been such a powerful teacher for me, you know? And, and, it, and you know, Lahavdil, Aleph Al Tamim, like the, you know, totally different, but, but in my own experience, that sense of, yes, when I feel worthless and lost, then I'm in despair and I give up, right? And when I can recognize the capacity, that I have the capacity to change, right? Exactly, hope, right? Then there's empowerment. And then there's the ability to resist whatever their just maybe my own internal messages that I've somehow taken in or whatever those messages are that say, I can't do it or it's not possible, or I'm worthless or whatever that message is, right? No, I don't have to accept that. I can see that there's another narrative that might be possible here. And that narrative is not that I'm already perfected, but the narrative is that I have this inherent ability which means I can live up to that nobility. Yeah. 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 I think it's interesting that the example of Mandela is an interesting example, right? Of like, what does it mean to claim dignity <coughs> even, in the, even in the space of oppression? There's a great story he tells when him and Joe Bezos, which was one of his lawyers, um, Joe goes and, and uh, visits him uh, on Robben Island, and he walks out uh, and they're dressed, you know, you know that, that he's dressed in like shorts and short things, because he's African, right? And the guards are all in their court regalia, and he walks out with them and he walks up and he says, Joe, I want to introduce you to my honor guard. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and, um, and Joe Bezos tells this story, uh, and he says, um, you know, at that moment, they kind of like stood up straighter. <laughs> 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 like, because like that was, he, you know, he was walking with dignity, and like he was going to sort of, even though he was a prisoner, and of course they had the power of violence and all kinds of things in that situation, there was a sense of, right, of dignity and nobility, and that even, you know, his ability to relate both to his guards and to the people outside with right, tremend that capacity of nobility transformed the situation. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I, I haven't talked about it only because um, I'm trying to sort of stay with the Desmers teaching, and uh, I don't know what he thought or didn't think about the, the uprising. I just, I, we don't know if any, as far as I know, and we've read a lot of the material, we just don't have any information about uh, whether he, ha like what he knew about and whether he had it. And he was um, taken from the ghetto before the uprising happened, right? Um, so what I would say is, just again from my reading of him, there's no suggestion that this is in opposition to it. It's not like, oh, well, if I'm spiritually resisting, I'm against an uprising or violent resistance, right? And I don't think that's suggested by his text, and he's very clear about, you know, uh, sort of, he wants defense to happen. He wants the Nazis to be defeated. We see that clearly in, in, clear in this text. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. That is a great question. I, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. His brother was called a Rebbe Chalutz, a pioneering Rebbe. Um, I don't know. I just don't know. You know, I'd have to l have to look back. I don't know whether his brother's writing up, but certainly his brother was an active political Zionist, right? Which meant that, uh, you know, he was involved in like the struggle for the states and the war of independence, et cetera, like that. So he wasn't a pacifist, right? So there, there w he certainly didn't see a contradiction between the sense of nobility and spiritual resistance, and then it may also translate into physical resistance. So. I want to do one thing to, to end up with and to take a look at our last text here together. And I'm just going to read it briefly and say a few words about it. Um, and it's really things we've already been discussing. I just want to sort of take it another step into kind of the mystical element, the mystical level of discussion of this. And uh, for those of you who are engaged in those texts or in, or in practices and meditation practice, this may speak to part of that. So this is a text from Yitzchar Bear of Zlotchchov. Um, any, any, I'm just going to skip down a little bit. He says, we're going to try to explain this statement in the Sabbath prayers. There is none like you and none apart from you. Right? For it says in the Talmud, a person cannot pray unless he makes himself like nothing. That is, that he thinks of the greatness of the creator and his supremacy, and that no place is empty of him, and everything is his divinity. And apart from him, all is nothingness and vanity. And each person, when he wishes to pray in this aspect, must first think of the greatness of the Creator and then begin. But when he begins to think of the greatness of the Creator, a great fear falls upon him, saying, Who am I, a mere man, and contemptible as I am, a putrid drop, to pray before the great, high, and exalted King? But afterwards, when he thinks further about the greatness of the Creator and realizes there is no place empty of him and that he is himself naught but a portion of the Godhead, then to the contrary, he will pray with great ardor, wishing to cling to his root and saying that I myself am also part of the divinity. And this is the meaning there is none like you. That there is no created being which can compare with you, greatness, and that all creatures are lowly compared to you and unworthy to praise you with praises and hymns. But afterwards, he says that on the contrary, there is nothing apart from you. For there is no place empty of him, and he himself is also part of that, and it is fitting to cling to him. So in some ways I just think, and this is a perspective which occurs multiple times in the Hasidic text, it brings together a lot of what we're saying, which is, is sort of a mystical question, is what does it mean to be nothing? Right? What does it mean to be empty? Like I mentioned this in Shabbat, but right, there's this famous joke, I think many of you know it, right? Before Yom Kippur, the rabbi goes up to the bima, he's standing, he's davening, starting his chest, oh, I'm nothing, I'm nothing, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. Cantor comes up, standing there pounding his chest, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. The shamish who takes care of the shul, sees them doing it, he's like, oh, that looks like a good idea. Walks over, he's meekly up, starts saying, I'm nothing, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. The rabbi turns to the cantor and says, look who thinks he's nothing, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? So like, we all know how this, like any part of this can just become another game for the ego. But what this text says is it's trying to recognize in you know, a language which is a sort of our profound emptiness, which is actually our profound fullness, right? We're nothing special, right? We're nothing special, and that's fine. 
like we're just one more speck of dust in the universe, right? We're just one more human being among millions of human beings. We don't have to be the extraordinary human being. We could just be an average human being, right? And we are nothing, which means that we are part of that divine nothingness, that divine emptiness. We are part of that. Right? We are divine ourselves, right? And we want to hold those things together because ultimately they're the same thing, right? Ultimately, that we're saying is, what is our nature? Our nature is not about my own uniqueness or my own specialness. It's about saying, how can I, as a piece of the creator, as a piece of divinity, serve this wholeness, which is the creator, which is divinity? How can I, as something which is actually not fundamentally separate, by the way, not fundamentally separate from anything else, everything else out there, how can I serve the greater wholeness of which I'm a part? And that's being nothing, right? Small n, maybe. <laughs> and that's being nothing, big N. And that's saying, I am but dust and ashes. And that's saying, for my sake, the world is full, right? I am in both, in, at the same moment, the center of it all. And I am willing to make everything else the center of it all. And to give myself to the center wherever it emerges. So it's a very challenging topic. Like we've talked about it, we've explored it a little bit, but it's incredibly challenging. And it often comes down to that sense of, and this is sort of where I want to end, just more noticing my own experience, which is that actually both my false humility and my false pride are all defense mechanisms and ways of trying to remind myself that I'm not. Right? So my arrogance, when it's false, is like, oh, I gotta be pride and arrogant and be the big one in the middle of the room and special and something because otherwise I feel like not okay and not safe and right, so, some fear, something's not okay rising in me. And when it's like, oh, I'm too small, I can't do this, whatever, whatever, then it's like, oh, if I'm too small and too this, then I'll protect myself, I won't take the risk, I won't fall flat on my face, right? I'm protecting myself in one way or another. And when I can let go of both of those places and find a place in the middle, it's actually because I've been willing to open up and say, it's not about me. It's not about defending myself. It's not about putting up the armor. It's not about making sure I'm safe. It's actually about courage and commitment and being willing to serve in this moment and seeing how genuinely and how truly I can serve to whatever extent I can at that moment. So, Yashikov, everybody, wonderful learning together. And we all serve this week. <laughs>